This lecture looks at VLANs and gives an introduction to some of the fundamental areas related to VLANs. One of the most basic concepts is the idea of a broadcast domain and it's the thing that makes the internet so dynamic in that hosts can join the internet and it's ARP that allows other nodes to be able to find them for the last part of the network. Basically, if one node wants to find the MAC address of another node that it knows its IP address, it sends a broadcast ARP packet to the whole of the network subnet. So in this case, all these nodes will receive the ARP packet where this node asks for the MAC address of this node. When this node detects that it is its IP address, it returns back only to the node which requested it, its MAC address. When that happens, the, MAC address, the ARP table on the host that asked for the MAC address will update its ARP table. In this way, we can dynamically add and delete computers from the network. After a while, the address mapping is aged out of the ARP cache and the host must re-ask for it. So if a node goes offline, then it will, it will need to be requested again. Basically, a network bridge which works at layer 2 will forward any broadcasts on to another network. And basically any node within inside the broadcast domain can see any other node and find it. So a bridge extends a network segment. A router on the other hand will block any ARP and broadcast traffic so these nodes cannot communicate directly and find each other's MAC address. There is also no need for it. It is up to the router to be able to route the traffic. Repeaters also extend network segment, basically cleaning up the signals, multiplying the signal strength and resynchronizing. The bridge also in this case will forward ARP broadcasts along here too, but it will be stopped by this port. Also, the router only forwards for a network segment which is on that segment. If we see here the extent of a broadcast domain, we see nodes A to K. A and B are in the same broadcast domain because the broadcast will be bound, stopped by this port on the router. A hub forwards broadcast so it will go to C, it will also go to E but it will be blocked by this port here. F will go through the switch, the switch will forward on through the bridge to G and also to H but the broadcast will be stopped here. And the repeater also forwards, so it forwards it to the switch, which connects to J and K, but is bounded here. So the ARP, ARP only applies within inside the broadcast domain. Nodes within inside that broadcast domain can connect directly to other nodes because they can actually discover them within inside the broadcast domain. Here we see a hub, and the hub connects the broadcast. Okay, so how does the internet actually work, and how is it that computers can add and delete themselves from the internet, and other destination nodes can find them? Well, basically, when this machine wants to talk to this machine, 
This machine does not need to know the MAC address of the destination. It would be too difficult for it to find that out. So basically what it does is it puts its own IP address in the source and the destination IP address of the destination node. Then it adds its own source MAC address and through ARP it has already discovered the MAC address of the gateway. So the first data frame that goes out as the destination MAC address of the gateway port of the router. The router then knows the best route to get to the destination. It will then forward the data frame over, this time using the source MAC address here and the destination MAC address of the next gateway. Again, the IP address doesn't actually change. Then this router then forwards that on and the data frame that's transmitted has a source MAC address of MAC5 and a destination of MAC6. Only when it gets to the last network does the actual MAC address of the destination node need to be resolved. In this case, we can then communicate directly with this host because we have the correct details for its MAC address and for its IP address. And it's this magical last segment where we can resolve the MAC address that makes the whole thing work. So typically we go through the, the internet using routers. Each router typically takes up to layer three and then forwards on. So the key thing that any node, when they wish to get out of a, of a local network is to broadcast for the default gateway MAC address. So typically the IP address of the gateway is defined on, on the computer and then an ARP is used to discover the MAC address. Once those are determined then it is possible for the host to be able to connect to an external network. Basically ARP here allows the gateway to determine the MAC address of the actual destination. Same again for the intermediate devices, they discover each of the gateway MAC addresses by an ARP. So ARPs stay with inside each of their subdomains. This, this lecture focuses on the Cisco BC MSN certification and provides a basic introduction to switch networks. The main areas that we'll look at as part of the, cert the certification includes the span entry protocol, multicast and general availability, VLANs, trunks and VTP, quality service, multi-layer switching and security. The first part just is a basic introduction to switching. Basically, we're moving away from older network structures where 80% of the traffic within a network uh, was typically local and only about 20% of it were, was destined for other networks. These days, much more traffic is destined for external servers such as on a server farm or a DMZ or for the internet. So much more there is a move towards 80% of the traffic being destined for other networks and only 20% being local. So this leads, leads to the 2080 rule as opposed to the 8020 rule. Newer networks are now also based on a switched infrastructure. Basically most medium and large scale networks are based on a three layer architecture. At the access layer, the user accesses the network typically by connecting to a switch. This provides local access and nodes within side this domain can typically communicate with each other. The main difference though is if we create a VLAN then the nodes can be isolated. At the layer above we have a distribution layer where we distribute the connections between 
various switches so we can now get intercommunication between devices which connect to different switches. This can operate at layer 2, which is the most efficient layer to operate at and can be switched, or it can operate at layer 3. So this layer we see either layer 2 devices to switch or we see layer 2 stroke layer 3 devices which can root at layer 3 level. At the core we have the main connectivity to the main switching networks. The reliability of each of the layers should increase as we go through. The core layer should be the most reliable of all, followed by the distribution layer and then the user access layer. The network bandwidth that it supports will typically also increase. If we have 10 megabits per second here, then we typically multiply up to 100 and then on to 1 gigabit per second at the core layer. So at the access layer, we typically get user or device authentication onto the the switch. We have VLAN membership where we can define the VLAN number that a host might be connected to. We can filter on basic MAC addresses and we can also now define the quality service for each user or each port on the switch where we might give high priority to one node and a low priority to another node. At the layer above we can interconnect between work groups. We can then interconnect between VLANs. So if this node is on VLAN 1 and this low node here is also on VLAN 1, this node is on VLAN 2, and this node is on VLAN 2. With VLAN trunking we can create a connection, a virtual connection almost, between the two VLANs which are the same. So in this case, these two nodes would seem as if they're on the same network uh, along with these two nodes which would be on another network. If we need to these machines to be able to intercommunicate, then we use a layer 3 interconnection. We can also define security policies at this level typically defined at a layer 3 access where we can define the traffic that's allowed to flow from one VLAN into another or from one network subnet to another. We can also have network type translation at this layer and address summarization typically in, in layer 3. At the core we typically get inter-site and inter-campus connections and also external access. The typical switches we see at each layer is a Cisco 1900 Catalyst switch or a Cisco 2900 Catalyst for access. For layer 2, layer 3 switching we typically see a 3550 Catalyst switch and for the core of the network we look at robust, high, highly robust switches such as the 6500 Catalyst. We see here an example of a network where we have access layer and as we'll see we can have failover routes that interconnect so that if one of the switches fails we have a, an alternative route to another switch so we have distribution here and then this gives us core and we can see we have some routers which allows the interconnection between different networks the 2900 is used here uh, the same with the with the distribution layer and a 3500 is used for a, a core layer here. For the basic configuration we typically have many ports on a switch. In this case we have 24 ports from FA0 stroke 1 to FA0 stroke 24 and we also have 2 gigabit links. By default we create uh, one VLAN which is named VLAN1 of which all the ports 
uh, can be associated with. Normally, if we operate at layer 2, there is no IP address associated with the interface. But we can use uh, an, a web server to be able to connect to the, the switch. If this is the case, we need to assign VLAN 1 with an IP address. It is this IP address we use to remotely access through Telnet or through the web. Telnet access is with the VTY and a console port is through CON0. We can see here that all the ports have been enabled and they are typically enabled by default. VLAN 1 though you can see is in the shutdown condition. So if we need to define remote access, we define uh, an IP address for the switch, in this case 192.168.1.100. The switches ports themselves do not need an IP address because we do not need to access them individually, we just need to access the switch. Some switches, such as the 3550, are layer 2, layer 3. So they can either operate at a layer 2 level or they can work at a layer 3 level. In this case, if we wanted to make the uh, Ethernet FA01 port uh, a layer 2 port, then we define the switch mode switch port mode access. To define a layer 3 port we say no switch port mode access. This will allow us to work as a layer 3 port for routing and we can apply an IP address onto it. If we want to trunk between VLANs on a switch, so from one switch to another, we need to enable a trunking port. Then the VLAN traffic will travel along the, the trunking port to the other switch, which will then be able to connect and join up the two VLANs. In this case, the first port is defined as a trunk port. And if we want to define a port as part of a VLAN, we say switch port mode VLAN and then the number of the VLAN. A VLAN with a number of two, with trunking enabled, will connect to another VLAN with a with a, a number of two on a different switch, as long as there is a trunking port defined. And that's the end of the introduction to this.